goes with that. Let's go back. Where did we start this whole course? We started with, with the following. Uh, control isn't everything, it is the only thing. Of course, you know that. And the whole world is what? It's out of control. Okay, the whole world is out of You know, that you have to pick up every newspaper every day, all right? My advice is don't read everything in the newspaper every day, all right? Spend more time on your own dreams, okay? I think you'll get more out of life that way, all right? Uh, everyone tells you need to keep up to date, but there's only a limit of what you can do with time, all right? Now, the next thing we learnt was out-of-control problems occur because of... <coughs> DHL, okay, and then you solve that with tender loving care, RAP. Then we moved into the next phase of this course where you already know this, this is a financial responsibility centres, chapter, uh, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, we, okay, and we focused on the 7, 8 and 10, financial responsibility centres. Why did we focus on that? Why did I give you this kind of, this is boring, you know, to, Neil, are you really excited about this? part of it, mm, that's sort of, not as excited as a strategy part, but I, you just need to be aware of it. Why? Because many of you may be put in positions where you're in an organisation where they have financial responsibility centres, so you need to know that they exist and you need to know the games that are played with them. And chap uh, chapter 5 intro introduced you to the gamesmanship. Okay, behavioural displacement, right? But chapter 5 didn't tell you the context in which it happens. Whereas now you go to chapter 8 and it really tells you the games that can be played. You with me? And sort of chapter 5 and 8 go very well together in that way. So sort of that's why I really want you to go through chapter 8 and try and understand more about that. That there is many different ways of setting up the budget. Okay? External, internal. Okay? At the beginning, at the end. Okay? Lots of different variations of the budgeting. So that's why we went through that. So do bear with me, I had to take you through some of these sort of mundane areas. Because most organisations around the world have financial responsibility centres and you know that because they have an accounting system in place. An accounting system is very cheap. Because it was there, why? Because of financial reporting, because they did the IPO. It's there because they have to pay tax and you have to justify what was the profit. It's there for that reason. And if you go to China, they've got three accounting systems. One for provincial government, one for tax, and maybe one for the customer. Okay? So, which profit would you like? Serious. I'm serious. It's, so, a fact is a fact that most organisations around the world have some kind of accounting system inside. So that's why financial responsibility centres grow out naturally of all organisations. Okay, it's a natural growth. Why? You go back to chapter 5. What's chapter 5 all about? Costs of control. Okay, so isn't it better to start with a system that's already there? You got my point. Good. So that's why we were there. But let's do a cause root cause analysis because very important to know that we need to go back, and this is what Apple does all the time. Uh, I did. This was uh, Premium Soft's business and personal twenty. You got to thirty-four people there. But root cause analysis. Remember that Apple does this all the time with the one thousand people on the ground in China. I know because I spoke to them. Okay. Root cause analysis. Root cause analysis. We can call this financial responsibility centres. So, what is causing these to occur? I know we put DHL in there, or you know, other way around. But root cause analysis is working out what causes an organisation to use financial responsibility centres. All right, what what is the original cause? And in here, we can put we can put in uh, we want to decentralise. Okay, or well, what's the cause of decentralisation? Oh, knowledge transfer costs. What's the cause of knowledge transfer costs? Mainly, it's size. Okay, can you see that? All right, so that's why there's a method in my madness here of having this circle here that, all right, we go from here, we go to financial responsibility centres, why is decentralisation there and not here? It's because I just want to show you that sort of size is the driver. Once we go to a larger organisation, size is driving, and because as we get larger, as Ken doubles or triples in size, maybe I can be a cleaner there one day, 
Okay, I could be doing that vacuuming. <laughs> All right, as it grows in size, I've, suddenly Ken doesn't have time to see everyone, to organise everyone, to the project teams and things like that. You have to delegate. And then suddenly, once you start delegating, oh, he might have to set up a cost center or a strategic business center. He might have a strategic center for Navicat and then another strategic center for, for the apps or the consumer side. You with me? Two different markets, two different responsibilities. And as it gets larger and larger and larger, then he may make each of them profit centers. So then, and then the manager in charge of that. So you can, you can get a sense of the evolution of a company from a basic one, because when we met Ken for the first time in uh, premium soft, they only had one unit, Navicate. But now suddenly there's a little baby being born, right? You know the four little table, the four desks, right? Ken's got a new baby, all right? It's called Instagram, it's called the apps, it's called the consumer. And so you can see, you, you're with me on this, all right? So the whole point of this was uh, size is growing, this, this, and this. But so far we got to week 10 and this, and I haven't even talked about customer. Duh. That is a big no-no. You cannot not talk about success in an organization. Remember I talked about control equals success right in the first week. You cannot talk about that without talking about the customer. And that's what we'll do for the next three weeks. We're going to have a break in a minute, and we're going to come back and actually get stuck into the good oil on what is it about the customer strategy, the system, measurement, rewards. And the big thing here is why. And you know why, because I, I remember I showed you that video right at the start and you're thinking, oh, that doesn't make sense to the first three weeks, you know. But okay, now you go and have a listen to that video again, especially after this Saturday and next week. And it will come. There's something in there that you didn't know in your strategic policy. And that's the big thing I want you to take away today is that Organizations have control over the processes and the culture. They don't have control what they think. They think they have control over the financing, the accounting, and the, cu and the customer. No, they don't. Well, maybe 1-2% of control over the customer. Well, they think they can. They think they, how do they do that? How can you have control of the customer? By brainwashing the customer. Okay, McDonald's and Burger King and wherever you eat. They do it all the time. You know where McDonald's is. You know where Mc Burger King is. You know, you know where Hungry Jack's is. Do they have that in Singapore? Oh, okay. But they still advertise, right? Think about it. Does McDonald's still advertise? Uh, do you know where McDonald's is? So why does, Mc why does a company advertise when you know its product? and you know where it is. It's brainwashing. It's, right? So that's, come on, you're bombarded with this every day. Think, but you never stop to think about that, have you? All right, so, uh, so in that sense, yes, w companies can so kind of control the customer. You know, you're walking down with, the, you, your kids get that bombarding with that advertising, oh, mummy, daddy, I want McDonald's, I want McDonald's. Okay, all right, all right, I've got to get McDonald's, all right? You see, you understand what I'm talking about here, all right? So when I say you can't control the customer, not directly, all right? So indirectly through lots of lots of marketing, you possibly can. But that's not the most effective way. The effective way is to work on the culture and work on the process, work on making the best product in the world, okay? Best product in the world. Apple does that. Samsung does that. HCC does that. All, all these smartphone companies are working on engineering miracles, making the best product in the world. Of course, they're throwing billions of dollars at advertising, but you cannot, advertising doesn't work if you don't have the best product. Let's keep moving here, because we've got the good oil here, and I want to take you through very, very fastly. So you know that you are here. You know that we've started, we emptied uh, financial responsibility centers. You know that I'm excited about this, because this is what happens if you just focus. If you don't learn my mechanisms for determining a performance measure, and just go straight to, oh, let's just come up with a new satisfaction measure. Let's just come up with a new non-financial performance measure. You're going to make this mistake time and time again. That is, you're just going to measure the wrong thing. And you're just going to cause the wrong behavior. What is the wrong behavior? Oh, how do we get the call center to do faster, faster, faster? Well, 
I'm going to give you a bonus for how many times uh, your average call. If you get that down, down to 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 10 seconds, wow, you get more money. What's that going to force? How's, that, how's the quality of the call going to be? Faster, faster, faster. It's about interface. Great, thanks. Okay, average call way down, you get a bonus. That's the way to do it, okay? All right, so wrong measure, you get the wrong behavior. What I'm going to tell you next three weeks, and I'm going to tell you today and take away is looking at measures is the last thing you should do. You need to look at the following things. Here's what you need to look at. This is the big framework. By the way, do you know where this framework came from? This is the O'Connor framework. Okay. I've been working at trying how best to effectively train professionals in developing non-financial performance measures. I've been doing that for the last 10 years. Okay, probably one area I do have over information overload on. Okay, and I, I want to come up with something that didn't have too many words called measurement. Okay, uh, notice in the last three or four weeks I really haven't said that. Okay, I haven't bothered you with that. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. But notice, where's, is there any measurement in here? Can you see the word measurement? Is the, is the word measurement here? Where? Wait a minute. Where? Where, where, where? Oh, okay, in the title. Okay, so a good framework that helps guide you to do something is one that actually doesn't have to uh, have presuppositional terminology. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the purpose of this framework is to guide you and to think about what measures should we use? All right, so, or to help you understand what is a measure. Now, if I use the word measure in the framework, then I'm assuming you know about measurement. But I'm using a, I don't use the word measurement, and that what, that's what makes a good framework. When you do not use the term that you want the user to learn about. You with me? With me on that? Okay. A good framework is like that. Okay. So let me show you how it works. Okay. Start here. No, don't start here. Remember, it's like cause effect diagram. I want you to go back into the causal mindset. Remember the cause, root cause analysis? You did that. Remember the out of control problem there, D H L, or you had uh, the manpower, machine, method, materials. Okay, you, you could put lots of things in there. Remember the fishbone diagram? You, th this is exactly the same way. Right? We're starting with um, here's what we want tomorrow, and then just work. What do we have to do today to get what we want tomorrow? Okay, so simple example. There's going to be a quiz tomorrow. Okay, we study today to do well in the quiz tomorrow. Okay, keep it very simple. Okay, it's a, no different from that. What do we want tomorrow? Okay, so you can work with an owner of an organization. You can work with someone to help them think through about what measures they should use. Give an example. Oh, maybe we're talking to Ken, and Ken says, Oh, I want, you know, I asked them, How do you know your workers are happy, right? Did I ask him that, right? How do you know the workers are happy? They say, Well, uh, I know they enjoy playing sport and different things like that. Okay. Uh, next time I go to Hong Kong, I'll, I'll ask Ken if I can interview some of the employees. That would be very interesting, wouldn't it, right? <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, outcomes, empowerment. Maybe Ken wants more empowerment, learning, or a fun place to work, right? That's, that's what he wants. He wants it to even be a more fun place where people are actually even more in, energized and people are knocking on the door, I want to work for you, I want to work for you. And it's not just about the stock options or the, the financial side. It's just, it's a joyous place to be with. Did, by the way, did Ken look like a boss that would be nice to work for? Yes or no? Yeah, he looked, he looked pretty straight. Did he dress up like a suit? Didn't look like someone like that, did he? It? it just looked like, not me, but it looks like you, you know? Okay, all right, empowerment. What do we, that's what he wants in the future, but what do you have to do today? Well, maybe we think about what are the roles of employees or create, doing stuff today, creating alignment with strategy or doing training today or what systems you have to put in today to actually try and get these outcomes in the future. Notice I have not mentioned the word performance measurement. I haven't mentioned that yet. We're just talking about what activities we have to do today to get what we have to get in the future. That's the first step. 
Well, the first step, write down all the things you want to have in the future. Another example, on-time delivery. All right, so what do we have to do today? Oh, we have to train, train the people, train the truck drivers. Train them so they know how to deliver properly, how to sequence the timing. Or maybe we have to put, put in a system that helps schedule the delivery better. Okay, so because that's the outcome we want. Notice I'm not talking about financial measures, I'm not talking about non-financial measures. We're just totally thinking about a, a causal diagram between activities today and outcomes in the future. That's the first thing I want you to take away here. See that? All right. And once you get your client to list down what do you want in the future? By the way, you as a consultant are you giving answers to the client? Am I giving answers or am I asking questions? Is this framework asking questions or giving answers? It's asking questions. Look, two big questions. One and two. See that? That's how you be a good consultant. You don't need to know everything, Mel. You just just need to know a few basic questions to ask. When people come to you, ask the questions. And, and through questioning, that is consulting. Okay, a lot of people get consulting wrong, thinking like a consultant is someone that has all the answers. No, no one knows everything. I don't know everything. All right, a, a good consultant is someone that asks the right questions. Okay, all right, and so this framework asks that question, this question, right? Question one, question two, get a list here, then you list down all the things that you think you can do, can't do, whatever, what has to be done. Okay, and then you may tick it off, you say, oh, we need to do this before this, before this. All right, we might give a ranking of one for this one, uh, five for this one, ten for this one, and so we rank them. So you prioritise, why? Because you don't have resources for everything. You got to, are you with me on that? No organisation has resources for everything, right? So even if you have a wish list, you prioritise, you do one before the other. Okay, all right, you've decided that, oh, we're going to do um, more training of employees so we can have less errors or faster cycle time. We're going to do more training. Now we've decided that we're going to do more training. Now we can think in terms of a measure. What measure could we use to give us a signal that we are actually doing what we need to do. We know we need to do it because this is the outcome we want, right? Now the measure is just providing a signal to tell us are we doing the training or not doing the training. So let me tell you as people that really you haven't been taught how to do measurement before, what measure could you use now if my outcome is I want to have better trained people in the organisation. And what I need to do today is I need to get some training system in place. So what measure could we use? Huh? What measure could we use? Frequency of training session. Pardon? Frequency of training session. Frequency, Frequency of training session, yes. Pass rate of the... Pass rate, yes. Number of employees who undergo the training. Number of employees undergoing training. As in, as in a feedback, as in what have they got out of the training? Okay, alright. <laughs> number of hours each other. Number of hours training. See, you're already measuring already. You see? There you go. That's, that's all it is. Don't, there's no more comp don't make it complicated. Okay? When it comes to measurement, you need to know the causal model first. Let me repeat. When it comes to measurement, you need to understand the causal model first. And then, number two, second, don't do this first. People make mistakes. Oh, we've got to find the measure, we've got to find the measure, we've got to find the measure. Oh, just Google it, you'll find it. Well then, but they forget about the causal model. They don't know what that measure is, you know, if it's high or low, is causing what to happen. All right, understand the causal model first. This, this is kind of like a framework to get that done first. This is the future, this is today. It's sort of like a causal model, okay? All right? Then measure comes second, all right? That's so easy, because then you say, oh, 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 so you want to do more training. You want to do more training daily. Okay, so why don't we think about uh, counting, let's start counting the training hours. 
let's just start counting how many employees undergo training. You see? And then we start put those measures, let's start tracking that. And then that becomes more visible. And that becomes part of the strategy of the organisation. I'll give you another example because it was in a workshop uh, for HKI CPA. I think I've got here. Oh. This was, uh, this was one event I was at on the weekend. So there's my, I'm a buyer, a speaker. Oh, here's my other identity. I was training for HKI CPA. There you go. See? Trainer. Okay? So Tuesday night, three hours training. Okay? Love it. I've done dozens and dozens of workshops. Anyway, so one, one of the persons in the training I was doing on measurement is uh, asked me, oh, so I've got this supermarket in uh, Ching Wan. You know where Ching Wan is? One of the first new town developments in Hong Kong about 25 years ago. And so it's sort of kind of like, it's about 10 kilometers north, uh, north, north, uh, west of TST. Okay, sort of on the way to the airport, but not quite. Okay, adjacent to Chingy Island. Anyway, long story short, got, he's working in the supermarket, and I said, "What's your number one challenge?" He said, "Well, I'm really not sure. We, we you know, we got to work out whether we want to target our marketing to the locals or the ones that come in from outside the region." Okay. So, real person, uh, real problem. And I said, okay, well, let's just start with a simple measure. You want to know, basically, they want to, uh, they want to have a better marketing strategy, target market. What do you have to do today? Well, we really need to know the demographics of the people that are coming into the organization, right? So, what type of measure do you think we can do for that? I'll take this off. My global sources one. Help me. What? All right. My future. Uh, the outcome that I want of this one of my clients in my training session is I want to know the cu which customers are coming in are local or far away because then when I do my marketing, I'm I want to do I advertise locally? Do I advertise all through Hong Kong? Do I do radio? Do I do TV? Okay. You see what I mean? That's, so, what do we want tomorrow? We want to have, um, we want to have more sales. Part of that is targeted marketing. You know, we could have several arrows here, right? We work back, causal model, okay? More sales, how do we get that? Targeted marketing, okay. So what do we have to do today? We have to know more about what? Who is the customer coming in, right? Right, I haven't talked about anything about measurement, right? What am I talking about? I'm talking about causal model first. Notice that? Notice that? We're talking, we get the causal model working first before we even talk about it. That's the thing that's missing from a lot of textbooks. That's the thing that's missing from a lot of balanced scorecard training courses, even courses, or even that portion that's put into strategy courses. Okay? So, uh, long story short, and then we're talking, I'm talking with him, okay? All right, so it looks like today you really need to have a sense of what is the breakup or makeup of your customers that are coming into the store. I guess that's right, that's what I want. All right, so how about you try this? Why don't you employ a student helper to stand out in front of the door maybe two hours a day for the next week and to try and get some, just ask a simple question of the people that come in and out. Oh, uh, are you local or are you far away? And just to try and get some sense. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll try that. I think I can do that. And that's what the participant went off to do. And so how could that help with the marketing strategy? Like finding out, uh, you know, asking customers whether they come from local or they come from further away, that is, and then you find out it's 40% local or 60% local or that's a measurement. You with me? That's a measurement. So what's the purpose of the measurement? Oh, so you can work out, is that the ideal mix that you want? Maybe you want to change the mix. Or it may guide where you want to target the marketing, you see? So the measurement gives feedback for some specific decision. So the great thing about this framework is this framework focuses you to fo forces you to focus on the cause effect first. 
Then the measurement comes second. <laughs> Sorry, that's just for that one student who said, oh, do we have to have noise in the, <laughs> noise in the PowerPoint? Okay, I thought I'd just slip that one in. All right, so um, here's the balanced scorecard. We know uh, what I do with my participants and what I'm doing in the last five minutes of today's session is that I'm introducing you to a very intensive session on Saturday. We're going to go for the full two hour lot. Very intensive. You've got to come and be prepared to be, uh, bring lots of energy and focus to the, two session, to the session we're going to go through. Alright, so we've got low, medium and high and I would ask the participants and you probably experienced this internship what are, the, what are the bulk of the communications? And in a profit making organisation, a lot of the communications are about financial. You didn't beat the sales. Come on, you've got to try harder. You've got to get those sales. You've got to get those sales. Or it's a customer. Oh, our customer satisfaction index is going down. You've got to get better service. Just do this. We've got to have customer satisfaction going up and up and up, but there's no communication to how to do it. And it's always about, here's our customer satisfaction. Here's our customer satisfaction. Fix it. Fix it. You're the manager. You fix it. Right? A lot of communications like that, but very few communications about internal processes, learning and growth. Communications like, you know, we've got to have more training, we've got to have a get together, we've got more competence training, we want to make you more capable so you can be more empowered, so you can actually do more sales, you can get bigger bonuses for yourself and you benefit our company better. Very few communications like that in a lot of organisations. Okay? Very few communications about internal processes, about how we can streamline. Let's have stand-up meetings. All right? One smartphone manufacturer I went to, they had a policy for meeting. If we're going to have a meeting, we need to have a written agenda for the meeting. The meeting should not go for more than half hour. And that agenda needs to be distributed to every participant that you're inviting 24 hours before the meeting. And it's got to have a clear action uh, plan that the meeting is supposed to try and address. Otherwise, no meeting is going to happen in this organisation. So that's kind of like communications about how can we make processes better. You see that? Nothing to do with the customer, nothing to do with sales. But very few of those communications occur in a lot of organisations. They're very focused on the customer for sales. And they forget that capability comes from the bottom two. By the way, here's a pyramid that uh, yours truly put together. This is not from a textbook. This is something I put together through my just my thinking, my reading, my just thoughts. I just put, put a lot of things together. And it's just really saying that a lot of organisations spend a lot of attention here because it's accounting, accounting, accounting. Get it? Financial Responsibility Centres. Got to make the profit. Got to beat the bi budget. Okay? Least attention down here. Why? Because there's less feedback. There's this feedback, least attention down there because it doesn't feel as though you're making progress when you're training people. When I put you in a room and I start training you, I don't feel that I'm making more sales. Do you know what I mean? If I'm a profit centre manager and I sign off that all my team go away for half a day in a training meeting, and I'm thinking, wow, that's an opportunity lost. That, that's a half a day of sales that we could have made. You know, you, that mentality. You had that mentality too. If you're under a profit center manager responsibility, you have the same mentality. It forces you to focus on those top two. Okay? But this is where change happens in organizations, how where change is re engineered. All right? So here's the thing I'm going to talk about on Saturday more about strategy, systems, and measurement. And here are a series of graphs here. I won't go them one at a time, but I just want to show to you that there's a lot of organisations around the world that are trying to use, I use the word trying, because they're not all successful, mind you, they're trying to use a balanced scorecard. And what are the reasons why? Well, one of the reasons for implementing, tracking progress towards goals. Need to communicate strategy with everyone, aligning employee behaviour with strategic objectives. They are some of the reasons why the balanced scorecard is used. Let me give you a few more graphs. It's, I don't want to go through every graph, but just to show you that there's a lot of evidence out there that people think the balanced scorecard is the solution. But often the balanced scorecard is poorly implemented. 
Uh, other features, ability to drill, drill down to root data, cause and effect strategy map, web-based reporting, traffic lighting trend indicators. So there's a lot of issues here, that reasons why. Here are some benefits of the balanced scorecard. Linking vision strategy helps managers manage the balance between financial and the non-financial, setting priorities, managing change. This is the big thing, managing change. I want to get to that because the benefits to adopters is not just measuring performance, increased communication, organization al alignment. And we're going to talk about that. But let's just, I want you to highlight one thing on this graph. Understand measure and strategy, cause and effect. Oh, that's a big thing you're going to take away in the next three weeks cause and effect. What did I just take you through with my little framework there of developing a measure? What did I take you through? What did, what were those two questions? What do you want, what outcome do you want to have for tomorrow? And, okay, what do you have to do today to get that outcome tomorrow? Is Does that sound like cause and effect? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, you got it. So, we're getting there, aren't we? It's coming around full circle. It's not like you're memorizing more and more and more. I just want to reinforce in different angles, okay? All right? And so this is what O'Connor put together. This is not from a textbook. Strategic objectives, measures, and systems thinking. If someone asks you today, you're going home, or you, someone stop you, oh, you're doing O'Connor's class. Is he teaching you anything? Oh, sure, yes, lots of things, okay. All right, what, by the way, oh, balanced scorecard? Oh, go and get him here. All right, yeah, so what's the balanced scorecard? You did his course today, did he teach you anything today? Balanced scorecard. What is it? You say, oh, SMS. SMS? What do you mean SMS? You don't SMS in O'Connor's class, do you? No, sure not, it doesn't allow us to do that. Only in those five minute breaks in between. But SMS does explain what the balance scorecard is all about. It's about strategy. It's about measurement. It's about systems thinking. Those three things. Now, think about this. For the rest of your life, you are not going to forget that, are you? Hilbert? <coughs> That's a very easy thing to remember. You don't have to worry about these four components, you know, financial customer, learning and growth process, I've got to memorise all them. You ain't going to forget it 18 months later. Okay? But SMS, that is the crux of what makes a scorecard effective. Those other four parts, that's just, they're kind of like, it's kind of the structure of the scorecard. It doesn't tell you why it works. Guys and girls, in the next three weeks, I'm here to tell you how to make the scorecard work, not to tell you what a scorecard is. Okay? If we get the SMS right, you can make it work. And most consultants don't get it right. And here's the re here are the benefits. Goal alignment, on-time decision-making, accurate decision-making and learning. And last but not least, we're just uh, five minutes over, if you ask me what would be the steps for me implementing a balanced scorecard? Well, here they are here. Again, a graph from yours truly. Where do we start? Oh, okay, over here. You work with the owner. Maybe I'm talking to Ken. What do the values have for the organization? What is your vision for the organization? What is the mission? All right, get a feeling from the owner. What is it, where is the owner going? You know that because you did strategy policy. But, Number two, who is the customer? Why do they buy from you? There's that W word again. Remember, I have not measured, I have not used the word measurement yet. Number three, what's the ability to beat competitors? Who are your competitors? How can you beat them? Okay, you watch the video of Ken. Who were Ken's competitors? Which country did they come from? And? Oh, you're good, you're good. I knew you'd get that. All right, and then we go number four, and this is our strategic competitive advantage. Okay, how can premium soft beat its rivals in India and Russia? Well, they can't beat them on labor costs, but they've got to beat them on some other way, okay? Maybe it's competency that they, uh, the computing skills or something else, okay? Or the fact that the way that they have a culture, they have less turnover, okay? And so they're able to marshal that that IP and that intellectual property and make it really, really work because the people stay there for much longer. Because when there's turnover, you actually slow down a lot of process. 
Uh, four, number five, we develop objectives. And number six, last but not least, we develop measures or KPIs. That's the whole process in uh, the whole consulting. So when you come in on Saturday, we're going to, I'm going to take you through uh, some successful firms. And I'm going to ask you, why are they successful? Do you know any of these organisations? Yeah. Okay, put your hand up if you know at least one of them. Yes, okay, good. I know one. I, I actually flew on this one last night. Yes, old cafe. Great way to fly. I don't get paid for that advert, by the way. All right, so we've got lots of... and But these companies operate for different reasons. They don't all just operate for the same strategy. They all have different strategies. And so on Saturday, I want you to appreciate uh, three main strategies that we could focus on, okay? Might overlap with some of your strategy course. On Saturday, I'm going to introduce you to, on the ground, how they actually implement strategy here, which finally will actually go into developing a scorecard. So in short, what I'm preparing you in the next three weeks is really the executional knowledge that will equip you to actually help an organisation put in one extra measure, two extra measures, maybe 20, maybe 30. Okay. I'm going to give you the confidence and I'm going to examine you on that too. So we, go, we have total alignment with what we're covering and the questions going to ask you in the exam. You're going to do a simulation game. Uh, week after next, we come in and play the game on a computer just for two, two sessions, no more. Any more, you'll get bored. Any less, you won't appreciate it. And there's a question on the exam that will ask you about your learning in the game. Okay? So everything we do in the next three weeks is tied to bring you down to the finish line with the exam. Okay? I'm totally focused on that. I want all of you to be successful. So uh, thank you very much. Go home, get a good night's sleep. Come in on Saturday. Wait a minute, Thursday night, Friday night. Okay, have two good night's sleeps. <laughs> All right, come in on Saturday full of energy because we want to go uh, fast for those two hours on Saturday. Okay, look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. <coughs>
uh, from last Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you.